Greetings. My name is Paul. Greetings. That's what I say. Um, my head's shiny. It's not as much natural light coming in. It's later in the day. So, more relying on the lamp here. And that is making my face reflect light differently than usual. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about what we are, how we are it, um, how we define ourselves. I am. You are. What does that mean? This is from Joe Dispenza. Following him. Listen to what he's talking about. He's saying, he's making the claim that what we think we are isn't accurate. A lot of people make that claim, and I support that claim. I agree with that. What we think we are isn't accurate because what we are using as a reference is something from the past, something that is a story we've told ourselves based on things that have happened to us but is no longer true. We're looking through the lens of the past when the past is over and trying to identify ourselves today from back then, but that's gone. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I do either. So when you recall something that has happened to you oftentimes we replay experiences if it's if it's important enough to remember 10 years later it was important enough to remember then and it was impactful and so there's a pretty good chance that we probably rehearsed it in our minds we went over it maybe uh, I can't believe this sorry our shoulder chest area clavicle bone structure itched and I punched right into the microphone my apologies for that assault on your ears whatever we went through in the past we rehearsed in our minds maybe thinking I can't believe this happened or I can't believe this happened to me one of those kind of thoughts I got thoughts on that maybe I'll talk about that sometime but uh, maybe oh if only I had done this differently or I can't believe that happened this was so great and we replay it the more we think over it the more we might start to adapt the memory like we're creating something new we're writing a new story Maybe we're 100% accurate, but oftentimes we're not. We don't attend to everything in the moment. And so later on, we, f we fill in the blanks um, with our brains, start to fill in the pieces of the story. We might remember as though somebody was there when they weren't there or that something happened that didn't actually happen. And it's really easy to do that. And we don't do it on purpose, but it just happens. We fill in the blanks. We like uh, the, br the brain likes a narrative, so we give ourselves a good narrative. And the more we go over a story sometimes, the more it becomes... Uh, or the further it gets from the actual occurrence, the truth, you might say. And so then the truth is lost. Unless you've got video evidence of it or some kind of recording, it's probably lost. Um, but we, we then sometimes use these histories that we've created, these narratives, these stories we've made up, we use those to define ourselves or to determine how we're going to act. For my whole life, I considered myself anxious, and I always threw back to preschool. When I was in preschool, I would hide under the table and cry every day. I was there two days a week for like two hours as a high school child development lab. Um, but for so long, I've had it in my mind that this I was there and I was miserable and I'm crying under the table. I have two recollections of that happening. One time I'm, I'm under a table, someone's trying to coax me out, and I'm crying. And another time I was underneath one of those like uh, indoor <laughs> uh, jungle gym things, a little slide, you climb up the back. The, play school or something that the hard plastic somebody's calling me I will call you back in a minute friend and um, so I, I remember hiding under one of those things and crying and so those are my two experiences that I really recall from preschool but I've had it in my mind that I was miserable there and this was part of my anxiety uh, I, was, I was shy back then and that developed into the anxiety later on recently my mom had some was clearing out stuff from her attic and gave me a box of old papers and, and pictures and stuff from when I was a little kid and um, there was a picture a couple of pictures of me in that preschool group when we had a little graduation with our cap and gown stuff at four years old and I was smiling and it challenged my personal history story my narrative because in the way I have it memorized the way I've recited it and citing it as early example of my anxiety problems I've I used it to represent that but then I'm looking at this picture of myself as a four-year-old, and I thought, if I was truly as bad off and affected by the anxiety as I remember it being, 
I don't think I would have been smiling. I don't think I would have had that. And so it, it may, I don't know, whatever. I don't remember. I don't remember what, what the situation was, but maybe I cried a few times and those were, those were traumatizing to me. Maybe it was the first time my mom had ever left me alone at the school and, and, I, and that was difficult for me and I cried. And so I have those memories locked in, but then maybe for the next couple of months, I, I was fine. I didn't have any problems. But for some reason, I only remembered the traumas, I only remember the traumatic moments. I only remembered the, uh, the, the things that got locked in because it was so emotionally driven. And so then I used that in some way. I don't, I don't think I, I didn't think about that my whole life. It wasn't until I was 20 years old or so, and then I started having, you know, getting labeled uh, anxiety disorder and it becoming a disrupted in my life. Before that, I was just shy and that was okay. But then, oh, now I've got a disorder, a disorder, and. And so that became like, well, it's an explanation for what I'm experiencing, but then it also became a crutch, or not a crutch, but like an excuse um, in some ways. But it became some, it became what I identified myself as or with. And so that's when I think I adopted this. Looking back at my life, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've always been anxious. I've always been shy. And here's an example of it. When I was in preschool, this is how it, how it went down. But So that became part of my story, but not until later in life. But it was part of my anxiety story. It was part of how I identified myself. And so, uh, so the, I wrote down some of these things that Joe Dispenza said in this, in this talk, this lecture that I was watching him on. And so he's saying, what you talk about in your past isn't the truth because you made it up um, because you don't have the same brain you had back then. And so that's exactly true. I, didn't, I don't have the same brain I had when I was four years old. I have a new brain now. And to think, well, I was anxious then as a four-year-old to, and to, to use that to influence me today... Um, it's make believe. It's uh, an imagined story. It's narr- It's fiction. I'm a, we're all fiction writers, and and that's true. We write our story. We write our. We, we're our own authors, and too much of the time, I think we rely on what happened to write our story rather than writing our story new. What we want to happen, but we have that control. We just don't. We don't embrace it. Um, so all right. So that's concept number one. That the past is. Uh, a make-believe story that we've created based on things we've experienced. Uh, the next stage of this, thoughts are the language of brain, of the brain, not the mouse, the brain, but of the brain. Um, you know what I'm saying? And feelings are the language of the body. So how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. This is all, I'm quoting Joe Dispenza here. Um, he says, if you, so if you think insecure thoughts in a matter of seconds, you're going to feel insecure. So brain is the language of thoughts and the heart and the language of feelings. If you think insecure thoughts, in a matter of seconds, you're going to feel insecure. And how does that happen? The brain thinks it, excites activity in the neural pathways, releases hormones, releases neurotransmitters, and tells the body how to feel. That's the signal. That's the communication device. These chemicals are how you, how you tell the body how to feel. Um, and then, so the moment you feel insecure, so your brain started the thought, I'm insecure, releases things, the body then picks up, okay, I'm feeling insecure. And then the brain, is so the moment you feel insecure, your brain is monitoring your feelings and is going to think more insecure thoughts. And so you feel more insecure. So I'm not feeling very secure right now. Flush of hormones to make me feel not secure. Uh, my heart's beating faster or whatever happens. And then my body goes, wait, your heart's beating faster. Are you feeling insecure? And I think, I'm feeling insecure. And then there you go. There's the cycle. Joe Dispenza says, then the repetition of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind of insecurity. And then the person says, I am insecure. So this happened for me in my life. I experienced things that I felt uncomfortable. I thought, I feel uncomfortable. My body responded, here's your discomfort that you're feeling. I thought I'm feeling uncomfortable and back and forth. And so all around the topic of shyness or anxiety, social anxiety, feeling uncomfortable in groups of people, etc. And so they got to the point where I am an anxious person. That was how I identified. And then so this is the here's here's the the punch, the punchline, I don't know. Here's the meaningful part of this. And whenever you say I am anything, you are commanding your mind and body into a destiny. How about that? Whenever you say, I am, you're commanding your body to become that. I am anxious. I am depressed. I am an addict. I am stupid. I am weak. I am afraid. I am whatever. Or 
The other side would be all the good things. I am loving. I am peaceful. I am patient. I am calm. I am thoughtful. I am uh, creative. <laughs> I struggle to come up with creative. That's funny to me. I am funny. So I keep telling myself. And so, all right. So then we're, we're commanding ourselves what to be. So then how can we change? If, we're, if you're in this, I was in that. I was telling myself I am anxious. How did I stop doing that? I stopped focusing on it. I stopped thinking about my anxiety. I stopped worrying about being worried. I don't know how else I did it. I just I stopped thinking about it. I stopped giving my attention to that. I started living my life, I guess. I, I was stop recovering, start living before I even put those words to uh, into a phrase. Um, but I let go of it. It didn't I didn't I didn't I am it anymore. I didn't own it. I didn't attach to it. I let go of it. I let it, I let myself be free from it. Um, so he says, so how do people change? Something has to go so wrong that they finally make up their mind. I don't know why I'm speaking so loudly, but I am. That's me, not Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza, <laughs> I just realized that I'm yelling. I guess I read, when I read, I up the volume or something. I don't know. So how do people change? Something has to go so wrong that they finally make up their mind to change. Because in the moment after the trauma, they don't feel like themselves. So... When something goes so wrong, they experience trauma and they don't feel like themselves because they've been broken out of their routine. You're no longer thinking the same thoughts you were thinking yesterday, doing the same things you were think doing yesterday. You're now in a new routine. You're doing things you've never done before. Your brain is interpreting things all fresh because a new scenario has been presented to you. And it could be, and typically it's something that's traumatic, but it could be something really good too. But whatever it is, it's something that shocks you out of your everyday routine. And then that allows you for a moment to see yourself as an outsider and you think, well, this doesn't feel like me. This isn't what I do. And then so you get this moment of awareness. And then from there, you some people can use that awareness to then say, well, I don't like this. Or I do like this. This is better. Or this is worse. And then they can start making those changes. They implement changes. They stop saying, I am whatever and start saying, I am whatever. You know? So I'm, I, I, that, 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 bah, whatever. When I was in the army and I got, I had the panic attack, that's where I think it really cemented for me. I am an anxious person. I have an anxiety disorder. And so that was a traumatic thing, and it went in the direction that I don't want it to go in. And it spent, I spent a long time coming out of that. But that really cemented for me. It was something that was completely different. It was like, okay, my body just did something I had no control over. It was terrifying, all because somebody was saying things to me that made me uncomfortable. And then I didn't want to do what these guys said that I was supposed to do. And now I'm having a panic attack. I felt like I was having a heart attack. I thought I was dying. I said, I think I'm dying. I didn't, obviously, and I wasn't, but I thought I did. I thought I was. In the moment, it was so new and, and scary to me. It shocked me. So in that moment after the trauma, I didn't feel like myself. So who am I? I have an anxiety disorder. I am depressed. And then that's who I was for years until finally I got out. I grew out of it, whatever. Experienced my way out of it. Stopped relying on that. Stopped calling myself that. And um, I think going to college and, and studying psychology was a big part of that. It increased my awareness, and I stopped. I, I just I had other things to do than to rely to call myself anxious. Um, so, but he says, so why wait? Uh, why wait for these these big deal moments when everything's difficult? He says you can learn and change in a state of suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy. It's your choice, right? So, why do we wait for the trauma to make the move? Start making the move now um, when, it's, when you have some peace and clarity in your, in your mind, in your life. And if you don't, if you're already in the trauma, you're so deep into it, you don't know how to get out of it, you start thinking differently. You imagine moving on. This one of my, I have a website, imaginemovingon.com. I don't use it. It's just like a reference point. But that's that, that phrase, it comes from a book, um, The Biology of Desire by Mark Lewis. And he said, it, it's the one point he's talking about, if you can't imagine yourself breaking the addiction, living a different life, you're never going to get there. You have to first imagine yourself moving on. So I love that phrase, imagine moving on. If you don't feel like you can ever change where you are right now, imagine yourself moving on. Imagine it. Because if you got yourself there by saying, I am, you got to stop saying you are that, those things, and start saying, I am this. And if you don't know what to say, imagine yourself. What would you want to be? I am prosperous. I am, uh, I am experiencing abundance. I am grateful for all of the things in life. I am uh, capable at my job. I am intelligent, whatever it is. I am, and then build yourself into that thing. That's the power of the mind and creation and the spirit. It's your power. 
you've got to embrace it. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else wants to do it for you. Some people might think that they want to do it for you or try to want to do it for you or control you, but you got to do it. And I have to end this video or I'm not going to be able to put the fade in on the front and the back. And I like doing that on these videos. So that's all I got for this one. Not really. It's just where I'm going to stop because I want to put the fade in features on there. Okay. So tune in tomorrow for another exciting adventure of Stop Recovering, Start Living with Paul Brody. That's me. Good night and good luck.